we will always remember Warl Dane's contribution to the music world. And knowing that he was trying to get a Nevermore reunion together that was sadly blocked leaves us with a bit of a sour taste in our mouth now that he is no longer with us. However, Nevermore has always been one of the most intriguing bands since their debut in the early 1990s, and whenever they left us in the early 2010s, it left us hoping that a reunion would one day happen. Unfortunately, with Worrell's death, that no longer can be, but we still have one final thing left to do, which is to take a look and examine the seven works that we were able to get from this group, excluding the In Memory EP, and rank them all. So let's take a look at these albums, let's find out which ones were the gems, and which ones were just okay. Because really, like a lot of the other bands so far in the series, there are no real wrong answers with Nevermore. All of these albums really do bring something to the table. So we start with number 7, which is Enemies of Reality. Enemies of Reality isn't so much a bad album, more so it just fell victim to a bit of really bad timing and bad luck. First of all, it was slated to try to follow up Dead Heart in a Dead World, which was a fantastic album by its own stretch. However, this was an album that was marred by a really subpar production and material that felt like it had a little bit of that Dead Heart spirit in it, but perhaps not as much of the kinesis. It does have some fantastic songs on it, so it's definitely not one that should be seen as the worst or the bad one or anything like that. But this is an album that needed its own remaster a couple of years afterward. And by that point, there was already a much more uh, fulfilling album on the way in this godless endeavor that helped us put Enemies of Reality out of our minds. So while this album is still seen as pretty good by the stretch of uh, the imaginations of a lot of fans, for me, it's the one that's at the bottom. Number six is Nevermore. The very first album that we got from the band showed some of what the band was going to be able to deliver to us for more than 20 years afterward. It's an album that was filled with strong and emotionally charged material that also was very well uh, supplanted by Jeff Loomis's guitar work and Worrell's just absolutely absurd singing ability. While these tracks may feel a little bit rough around the edges, for a very first effort, this still has a lot of the trademarks that we would later come to really appreciate and love about this band. Number five is The Obsidian Conspiracy. The last full length that we got from Nevermore was one that felt like it was suffering from some of the same downfalls of Enemies of Reality. It was following up a master work with this godless endeavor, and it just didn't feel like it synced up quite as nicely. But with that being said, it still maintained itself as Nevermore being an elite band with really strong leads and rural sounding just as good as ever. The material may not sound like it was really up to snuff with what had just come prior, but as a final album, it still delivered exactly what we wanted from this band. Big riffs really emotionally charged lyricism, aggression when was necessary, progression whenever it was required, the Obsidian Conspiracy was still pretty damn good. Number four, The Politics of Ecstasy. I think this is one of the more underappreciated albums in Nevermore's discography. This is one where we really started to see the band expand their horizons, and between this and the In Memory EP, we saw that the band had true diversity that perhaps was only shown somewhat with the self-titled album, but not shown with the majesty and the growth that the politics of ecstasy was really able to afford us. This is one that contains tracks that are very long, lengthy, brooding, and very dark in nature, with songs such as Passenger really displaying that this band had the capability to haunt just the same way as they could use their aggression uh, in order to really display whatever feeling, emotion, or story that they were attempting to tell. The Politics of Ecstasy is one that I feel a lot, should, a lot of folks should seek out, and this is an album that if you don't have in your collection, you should certainly do what is required in order to get it. Number three is Dead Heart in a Dead World, the follow-up to Dreaming Neon Black, and just a fantastic album that brought uh, Nevermore a lot of success, with songs such as The River Dragon Has Come really providing them with some of that breakout commercial appeal. Believe in Nothing doing the exact same thing to the point where some of these songs have been covered by other metal acts, really showing that Nevermore 
was able to reach out not only to fans, but also to their peers and showcase themselves as a bit of an influence as well. Dead Heart was an album that was really chronicled by the fact that all of the songwriting felt extremely solid and felt like all of the sessions were very tightly guarded and the fact that they were in that same frame of mind for every song gave it a very balanced release. One that didn't exactly go very up and down whenever it came to the song lengths like we would see with some other albums such as The Politics of Ecstasy or even its predecessor Dreaming Neon Black. But Worrell's vocals are just absolutely out of their mind. Jeff's guitar work is brilliant. The band felt like they were kicking on all cylinders at this point. Number two, this godless endeavor. This, for many people, is the masterpiece. This, for many people, is the number one. This, for many people, is the album that gave Nevermore their true crowning achievement, especially whenever you consider the title track that ends this album with such a large purpose, one that spans eight to nearly nine minutes and just absolutely destroys all the way through. But this is an album that is able to utilize a lot of the lessons that were learned from albums such as Dreaming Neon Black and Dead Heart in a Dead World and even some of the follies of Enemies of Reality in order to build just the perfect beast. One that was able to juxtapose up and down and really create a roller coaster of heavy metal that showcased the aggressive side of this band when it was ultimately required, but also showing that this band was able to utilize Worrell's immense range to their full advantage. This is a terrific album. This is one that, that, if you don't own this in your collection, it would probably be a very fitting starting point. However, number one is Dreaming Neon Black. Now, I admit one thing right out of the gate. This is the very first Nevermore album that I ever owned. Does that sway me a little bit? Maybe it should, but that's not the reason why it's number one. The reason why this album is number one is that, unlike a lot of these other albums, Dreaming Neon Black is an album that not only do you listen to and hear, but you also ultimately feel. The story behind this album is extremely sad. It's all about losing somebody that you love to a religious cult, to fanatics, and watching somebody that you loved so dearly transform into something that is completely unrecognizable to the point where it makes you so crestfallen that you yourself become changed to the point to a potential death. And this album is able to showcase, utilize, and make you feel every iota of that. And based around that, Dreaming Neon Black is always going to be the go-to album for me for Nevermore. Considering Worrell is at his absolute best whenever it comes to his vocal delivery, each and every emotional iota is emitted from his voice. You can hear the torture, you can hear the pain, you can hear him at times sounding like he's fighting back tears in his eyes as he's delivering some of the lines, especially whenever it comes to the title track. Nevermore always seemed to have a really good knack for uh, producing really solid title tracks. But this album's feeling transmits itself onto you and it resonates onto you where you yourself start to feel an emotional attachment for this character who is losing everything and ultimately loses themselves. Dreaming Neon Black is an album tells a story that may not necessarily be uh, supported with the Paramount material, which actually was on this godless endeavor. However, considering the way in which it makes you very emotionally invested, draws you in, keeps you there, and tugs on you, makes this the go-to Nevermore album at least for me. I want to know your lists for the best Nevermore albums from 1 to 7. You can include the In Memory EP if you desire. I chose not to, considering I wanted to just go with the full lengths. And of course, if you don't have any of these albums, you can go and visit the link in the description box for the Cover Killer Nation Amazon page, and you can order them for yourselves. And I highly recommend that you do that. Please let me know what your lists are. I apologize if I sound terrible. I've been sick for the past two weeks, but these need to be done. So I will see you guys next time. I'm Cover Killer Nation. Have a good day.